The music of the spheres, or harmony of the spheres, is an ancient philosophical concept that regards proportions and the movement of celestial bodies as a form of music. The idea is most commonly attributed to Pythagoras, who is quoted as saying, There is geometry in the humming of the strings. There is music in the spacing of the spheres. This idea remained a central theme of philosophical thinking for more than two millennia, where numerous influential scholars used different metaphysical or aesthetic arguments to associate each celestial body with a certain pitch, according to the best musical theory of his time. In the case of Pythagoras, legend has it that he was walking past a blacksmith shop when his attention was attracted by the harmonious ringing of the anvil. On inquiring within, he was told that the hammers were of different weights, each one producing its own pitch. This explanation supposedly led him to the idea of musical intervals. While I like the story, it could also be that Pythagoras discovered consonances by experimenting with string length on a monochord, an ancient musical and scientific lab instrument involving one string. Consonance is defined as a combination of notes which are in harmony with each other due to the relationship between their frequencies. Pythagoras is accredited for discovering the simple fact that the pitch of a musical note depends on the length of the string which produces it. This allowed him to correlate the intervals of the musical scale with simple numerical ratios. And this is what a monochord looks and sounds like. An important point here was his attempt to reduce an element of human experience, in this case sound, to mathematics, which was an essential step in the development of science. A central belief of Pythagoras and his followers was that everything is number. Pythagoras thought that numbers were divine, and ironically an expression of God's mind. Pythagoras was also deeply spiritual in that he believed that the soul was immortal and imprisoned in the material body, essentially subscribing to the concept of reincarnation. Pythagorean philosophers believed that there was a close divine relationship between numbers and geometrical forms. For example, they revered the pentagram, as each diagonal divides the two others at the golden ratio. The golden ratio is commonly found in nature and was used in ancient architecture and can even be observed in music. A very simple yet effective articulation of this point was made during a Daffy Duck cartoon, as Walt Disney himself was rumored to be a Freemason. So I'd like to play a short excerpt of it now. Come on, let's go to ancient Greece, to the time of Pythagoras, the master egghead of them all. Pythagoras? The father of mathematics and music. Mathematics and music? Ah, you'll find mathematics in the darndest places. Watch. First, we'll need a string. Stretch it good and tight, plunk it. Now divide in half, plunk again. You see? It's the same tone, one octave higher. Now divide the next section. 
and the next. Pythagoras discovered the octave had a ratio of two to one. With simple fractions, he got this. And from this harmony in numbers developed the musical scale of today. You can imagine how excited Pythagoras was when he shared his findings with his pals a fraternity of eggheads known as the Pythagoreans. They used to meet in secret to discuss their mathematical discoveries. Only members were allowed to attend. They had a secret emblem, the pentagram. Let's see what the topic is for today. It was our old friend Pythagoras who discovered that the pentagram was full of mathematic. The two shorter lines combined exactly equal the third. And this line shows the magic proportions of the famous golden section. The second and third lines exactly equal the fourth. Once again, we have the golden section. But this is only the beginning. Hidden within the pentagram is a secret for creating a golden rectangle, which the Greeks admired for its beautiful proportions and magic qualities. The star contains the golden rectangle many times over. It's a most remarkable shape. It can mathematically reproduce itself indefinitely. All these rectangles have exactly the same proportions. This figure also contains a magic spiral that repeats the proportions of the golden section into infinity. To the Greeks, the golden rectangle represented a mathematical law of beauty. We find it in their classical architecture. The Parthenon, perhaps one of the most famous of early Greek buildings, contains many golden rectangles. Portions are also found in their sculpture. In the centuries that followed, the golden rectangle dominated the idea of beauty in architecture throughout the Western world. The Cathedral of Notre Dame is an outstanding example. The Renaissance painters knew this secret well. Today, the golden rectangle is very much a part of our modern world. Modern painters have rediscovered the magic of these proportions. 
Leonardo da Vinci, like many other artists throughout the ages, made extensive use of the golden ratio to create pleasing compositions. In The Last Supper, the position of Jesus is perfectly plotted by arranging golden rectangles across the canvas. You can observe the golden ratio all around you. Flowers, seashells, pineapples, and even honeycombs all exhibit the same principal ratio in their makeup. In terms of music, each note has its own vibration and sounds that conform to the golden ratio are pleasing to the ear, while those that don't sound like there's something off. When a wrong note is played in a symphony, even the untrained ear can recognize that there's something wrong. It seems that we're somehow programmed to understand the mathematical relationship between notes and harmonies. The first confirmed discovery of a musical instrument we have comes from around 35 to 40,000 years ago, which has been claimed by some to use the same seven note scale we use today. The harmonic qualities of music can have a profound and beneficial effect on the human psyche. Plato said that, quote, music is a moral law. It gives soul to the universe, wings to the mind, flight to the imagination, and charm and gaiety to life and to everything. A sound bath is defined as a deeply immersive, full body listening experience that intentionally uses sound to invite gentle yet powerful therapeutic and restorative processes to nurture the mind and body. There are different techniques and instruments that can be used. The first example here utilizes gongs. Please adjust your volume accordingly. Of course, there are a number of different instruments used in sound therapy, each with various healing results, depending on the individual, probably the most common being the crystal bowl.
these are really for shifting consciousness and getting you deeper in, into these uh, very sublime energetic states. Now these are called rainbow bridge tinka bells because the, uh, the the way they're fired it uh, creates this rainbow colors and his gong is a rainbow bridge gong and you, you will hear it in a minute and so uh, as usual well, this is this is the original Tibetan model that that wake up the seventh chakras and so I decided to do just a little sound introduction and uh, show you how I, I managed to uh, integrate that with my go old friend, my new old friend, the the wolf. Okay. Hello everyone. Today we're going to look at a very simple instrument, very accessible to all of us, and one of the favorites amongst folks who attend the sound baths that I've done at Peace Awareness Labyrinth and Gardens in Los Angeles. It's called the Koshi chime, and here it is. It's a wind chime, but it's also actually a very highly tuned instrument and it has the sweetest of tones. Among other things, such as math and geometry, Pythagoras was also described as the father of music. Having discovered or rediscovered musical intervals, he taught that you could heal using sound and harmonic frequencies. He was the first person in recorded history to prescribe music as medicine. The concept was that each individual object, from the macro to the micro, had a particular sound, and that these unique individual rhythms and vibrations formed a universal harmony contributing to the whole. He affirmed that music is present everywhere and governs all temporal cycles, such as seasons, biological cycles, and all the rhythms of nature. Pythagoras condensed wisdom he had gathered through the mystery schools of Babylon, Egypt, and others, and synthesize these teachings into a new discipline which comes down to us as Greek philosophy, 
which uses number as its foundation, considered the most fundamental element of creation. To get to the core of his teachings, one had to endure three introductory years, followed by five years of absolute silence, followed by another five years of training. Only then were students ready to learn the most sacred mystery of numbers, which is called numerology, some elements of the Kabbalah, and how everything in the universe is really connected and can be accessed through the sacred science of numbers, geometry, and math. Generations of later Greeks built onto his philosophy, and Aristotle turned it into a science. But then came Christianity, and for the next thousand years, organized religion cast a shadow over science and aspects of the mysteries that became known as the occult. The study of visible sound is called somatics, and it reveals some fascinating truths about our universe that go unseen by the naked eye. Sounds actually have a distinct geometry, much like crystals and flowers and shells. When picked up by special apparatus, such as a sand-covered plate, these vibrations reveal incredible geometric shapes that are as unique and beautiful as snowflakes. There we are. Can you see the patterns on the top there? Now you'll see these patterns in nature. You see them on the back of tortoise shells. You see them in sunflower seeds. You see them in leaves. This vibration and the way it occurs is what's happening inside us. Let's do this one more time. A little bit more granulated sugar on the top. You can use salt as well. Take it away. So what happens is the higher the note, the more intricate the pattern. So once you get into ultrasound, things are very, very different. It was Nikola Tesla that once said, quote, if you want to find the secrets of the universe, think in terms of energy, frequency, and vibration. Which brings us to Dr. Reif, an American inventor who believed that everything vibrates at its own natural frequency. He attempted to discover the individual frequencies of disease-causing microorganisms in an effort to destroy them using the exact same vibrational frequency. In much the same way that opera singers match the frequencies of wine glasses with their voice and shatter them, in 1934, Reif used a beam ray machine he developed to cure 16 terminally ill patients with various cancers. The first 14 recovered in 70 days, the remaining two recovered three weeks later. Incredibly, the patients only required two three-minute sessions per week to achieve total recovery. Dr. Reif never claimed his machine was a cure for cancer and simply stated that it could, quote, devitalize diseased organisms and living tissue. He also warned about medical frauds that made such claims. An obituary in the Daily Californian described his death at the age of 83 on August 5, 1971, stating that he died penniless and embittered by the failure of his device to garner scientific acceptance. Reif blamed the scientific rejection of his claims on a conspiracy involving the American Medical Association, the Department of Public Health, and other elements of organized medicine which had, quote, brainwashed and intimidated his colleagues. After his death, ineffective imitations of his machine were marketed using Reif's name as a cure for AIDS, cancer, and other diseases, ending in several cases of health fraud in the U.S. While it is prudent to have some sort of quality control and consumer fraud protection in the medical field, it seems that the FDA and organizations such as the American Medical Association, which is largely funded by the Rockefeller Foundation, is ignoring, overlooking, and rejecting alternative cancer treatments, despite promising results from low-risk therapies such as those involving sound, 
frequency, and vibration. My name is Robert Sepper. I'm an anthropologist. My published work is available on Amazon, as well as through various other major book outlets. They make a great gift. If you'd like to support my work, you can do that through patreon.com. There should be a link in the description section for those who are interested. I appreciate it very much. Thank you so much. Please hit the like button and subscribe for future updates. As always, I look forward to reading your comments, so kindly leave me your thoughts below. Please have a wonderful weekend, and I hope to see you again soon. Sometimes, a nice walk on the beach can be a spiritually fulfilling experience. There's something about the rhythmic, hypnotic sound of the waves and looking out over the endless, expansive blue water that both elevates and calms the spirit in a way that's hard to duplicate from being indoors. Being out in nature can be psychologically liberating, almost in a divine way, even for those who don't consider themselves very religious. For those who do regularly attend a church, temple, or a mosque, there's also often a sense of peace that one experiences when entering these sacred spaces, which seem to contain subtle energetic forces that recent experiments, observations, and discoveries have shown actually mimic mystical elements found in nature itself. In fact, there's evidence that points to sacred geometry utilized by not only the architects of grand cathedrals and temples, but in man-made structures going back into prehistory, before advanced mathematics were allegedly discovered. In a recent video about sound therapy, I discussed somatics, a technology that allows sound waves to be translated into visual images through a medium such as sand, which reveals a relationship between sound and shapes. I'll leave a link in the description for those that would like to watch it. These findings point to ancient builders having the knowledge of the healing power of sound long before modern scientists did. Choirs, pipe organs, and architecture itself may have literally been healing church attendees for centuries, and the subtle energy of spaces was not limited to churches either, as megalithic monuments such as pyramids have also been shown to incorporate elements of divine math, meaning the shape and orientation itself contains certain effects of healing and other bioenergetic benefits. The Pyramid of Giza, for example, contains the spiral, the golden mean ratio, the triangle, and square. According to some classical authors, it was built to create the energy that facilitates a connection with the spiritual realms, for initiations, by adepts to go through a kind of death and become transformed, or reborn. While many modern researchers speculate that the Egyptian pyramids were used as a sort of power plant that could harness or even distribute electricity, it seems the occult historians, mystery schools, and members of secret societies seem to believe that the ancients were more concerned with a sort of spiritual energy rather than the sort of power used in modern civilizations. Known as prana in Hindu philosophy, chi or ki in Asian schools of thought, this universal life force energy has also been rediscovered in more recent times by people like Wilhelm Reich, an Austrian doctor of medicine and psychoanalyst who coined the term orgone to describe an esoteric energy which he claimed permeated everything and could be condensed and focused by the use of certain shapes and materials. Wright claimed that orgone, the cosmic bioelectric energy that he named after the orgasm, 
was a sort of ether that could be harnessed and concentrated into a box called an orgone accumulator. These boxes were made of plywood lined with rock wool and sheet iron and had a chair inside and a small window. They were constructed with multiple layers of these materials, which Wright claimed caused the orgone concentration inside the box to be three to five times stronger than in the air outside, and patients were expected to sit inside naked. The early accumulators were tested on plant growth and on mice with cancer, and Wright claimed to have positive results. In December 1940, Reich wrote to Albert Einstein, saying he had a scientific discovery he wanted to discuss, and in January 1941, visited Einstein at his home in Princeton, where they talked for nearly five hours. He told Einstein that he had discovered a, quote, specific biologically effective energy, which behaves in many respects differently to all that is known about electromagnetic energy. During their next meeting, he gave Einstein a small accumulator, and over the next 10 days, Einstein performed experiments with it in his basement, which involved taking the temperature above, inside, and near the device, and he observed an increase of temperature, which Reich argued was caused by orgone. Einstein later concluded that the effect was simply due to the temperature gradient inside the room. Reich believed that Einstein's change of heart was part of a conspiracy of some kind, probably because Reich was receiving negative publicity for claiming to have seen cigar-shaped UFOs with windows on them starting from around 1954 and seemed to believe the planet was under attack by aliens. Reich was visited on June 5, 1956 by FDA officials to supervise the destruction of the accumulators. On June 26, the agents returned to supervise the destruction of the promotional material, including 251 copies of Reich's books. On the 23rd of August, six tons of Reich's books, journals, and papers were burned in New York in the public incinerator on 25th Street. All his work on Vril or Oregon Energy was destroyed. It has been cited as one of the worst examples of censorship in U.S. history. Reich was then arrested, imprisoned, and soon after died in federal penitentiary of alleged heart failure. None of the academic journals carried an obituary. Time magazine wrote on 18th of November, 1957, quote, Wilhelm Reich, 60, once famed psychoanalyst, associate and follower of Sigmund Freud, founder of the Wilhelm Reich Foundation, later better known for unorthodox sex and energy theories, died of a heart attack in Lisburg Federal Penitentiary, Pennsylvania, where he was serving a two-year term for distributing his invention, the Oregon Energy Accumulator, in violation of Food and Drug Act, a telephone booth-sized device that supposedly gathered energy from the atmosphere and could cure while the patient sat inside common colds, cancer, and impotence. It is April 3rd, 1952. I, Wilhelm Reich, I happen to discover the life energy. I know what it means for the future development of medicine, biology, philosophy, and natural science. I'm fully aware of it. And in, these, in this awareness, I am completely alone. There's nobody here to listen to what I'm saying. The recording apparatus is the only witness. I hope that someone will, at some time in the future, listen to this recording with great respect for the courage that was necessary to sustain the research work in organ energy and life energy all through these years.
Reich claimed that his accumulator worked because of the layers of organic and inorganic material used, which literally attracted the orgone energy from the outside and directed it inside. It has been said that the Egyptian pyramids were designed with a similar principle in mind as they were originally covered with white limestone, which incidentally was stripped away and used in the construction of mosques, while the inner body consisted of a yellow limestone, in effect making the pyramid act as a giant orgone accumulator, with the results theoretically amplified by the shape of the structure and orientation in regards to the Earth's magnetic fields. The real function and application of the accumulated energy won't be fully explored in this presentation, but I've included another link in the description to a video specifically about the energetic qualities concerning the shape and orientation of pyramids. In this context, sacred geometry is the art of incorporating nature into modern architecture, often based on two fundamental patterns, the flower of life and the Fibonacci sequence. The flower of life starts with a single circle. As soon as you add a second circle, you'll notice you've created a new shape. This is called the Vesica Pisces. The Vesica Pisces is the shape created where the two circles overlap. This shape contains the basis of the golden ratio and the Fibonacci sequence. Keeping in tune with nature seems to have many benefits. The builders of ancient monuments used a system of measurements and proportions that not only aligned itself with the planet, but attempted to open up portals of communication with nature and the entire cosmos to draw in and manifest divine energy to the structure adhering to the Fibonacci sequence. Leonardo Fibonacci was an Italian mathematician who gets the credit for publishing and popularizing the sequence during the Middle Ages, but it was known long before his time. Before we continue, I'd like to play a brief video by Susan Jenkins that explains why this pattern is so important. The Golden Ratio, also known as the Fibonacci Sequence, what is it? And why does it seem to be everywhere in our world? Just a simple trip to your backyard can reveal an amazing display of nature, beauty, and design. And why is it that so many things in nature are divided into numbers of 3, 5, 8, 13, 21, and with the same proportions of the golden ratio? Even the design and the proportions of insects, such as bees and spiders, reveals a hidden code that seems to permeate our world. So I hope you will enjoy this presentation where I hope to share the amazing abundance of the order that is within nature called the Fibonacci sequence and the golden ratio. So what is the golden ratio and who is this Fibonacci guy? Well, Leonardo Fibonacci was an Italian mathematician who was often credited with this amazing mathematical formula. However, it's recorded that when he was asked where it came from, he replied, it's been around forever. And many believe that it came from the numerical sequences that are found in the breeding of rabbits. But regardless of who discovered it, it is an inherent principle in all of nature. So let's do a little example to further describe what these numbers are and how you can calculate them. I find it's best to simply start with the numbers. Basically, just take the first two numbers in our numeric system. Add those two numbers together to get the sequence. The next number would be 1. And then you continue in the succession of adding two numbers, the previous two numbers, one and one equals two. Two and one equals three. Three and two equals five. And this pattern can continue to infinity. Okay, so what does this mean? It's not just a fun little number game. The hidden beauty and order in the Fibonacci sequence can be seen when we put it to a visual application. Many are familiar with the typical nautilus shell or 
golden spiral. So let's do a little example. All you need really is a piece of paper, something to mark with, and a ruler. Uh, basically make a one inch by one inch square and put a one inch by one inch square adjacent to it. Then we will continue to add squares to the previous squares. Now, right now, I'm just speeding this up and you can see what I'm doing, but it doesn't really start to sink in until we start observing the relationships between the squares. There begins to emerge a pattern, a relationship known as the golden ratio. As artists, we realize that there is a certain inherent beauty in relationships of this nature. We typically call it the rule of thirds. Watch as I highlight certain areas or segments of this Fibonacci sequence example. You'll begin to notice that there is a pattern that continues throughout of the ratio of approximately one-third to two-thirds. The exact proportion is one to 1.6. And the golden spiral that is also found so much in nature can also be drawn within the diagram. So what does this all mean? Why is this pattern everywhere in nature? What does it mean to us as artists? Of course, as artists, we are examiners and interpreters of nature. So it only benefits us to learn the rules of nature and why there is an inherent beauty and order to it. For example, a landscape artist would benefit greatly from learning the rules of how trees grow and how they too exemplify and display the Fibonacci sequence in the order of their branches and the multiplicables of their growth. Not only will it benefit the artist to understand these rules, but recreating them effectively can also increase the chances that our artwork will embody the characteristics of nature that we are all so naturally drawn to. So I encourage you to examine and explore these relationships that are found everywhere, not just on earth, but even in the heavens in the way that hurricanes and storms often form. And yes, this pattern can be seen in the very fabric of life. We can even examine this numeric sequence and occurrence on a more personal level within our own bodies. For example, look at the 1 to 1.6 ratio of the human arm. The divisions from the shoulder to the elbow and the elbow to the end of the tips of the finger is a perfect 1 to 1.6 ratio. Breaking it down even further, the divisions from the elbow to the wrist and the wrist to the tips of the fingers is also a perfect 1 to 1.6 ratio. And by now, you've probably guessed it. Yes, this continues on into the hand and even into the fingers. As a matter of fact, the human body is a bountiful display of the Fibonacci sequence. Ever wonder why your front teeth are larger than the rest? or why your ear is shaped in the way that it is. Perhaps it is because the pattern of the Fibonacci sequence is encoded in our very DNA. So I hope I've encouraged you to become students of this grand design and have a childlike enthusiasm in wondering why this code is found in music, in architecture, and of course, in the beautiful artworks of the masters and many amazing artists of today. So in conclusion, Fibonacci may get the glory for this golden, very special ratio that exists in all of our universe. But truly, it points to a grand design, and yes, a grand designer. Dedicated to the Greek goddess Athena, the Parthenon follows the ancient Greek ideals of harmony, evident in its perfect proportions. The Parthenon's facade is circumscribed by a progression of golden rectangles. The width to height ratio is 9 to 4, which governs the vertical and horizontal proportions of the temple, as well as other relationships of the building. For example, the spacing between the columns. Over a hundred years in the making, Sagrada Familia is one of the most visited places in Spain. It also features a magic square within the Passion facade an arrangement where the numbers in all columns, rows, 
and diagonals add up to the same sum, in this case, 33. Heavily influenced by natural elements, a key part of the architecture of Sagadra Familia links geometry, nature, and organic elements in a seamless way. The principles of sacred geometry to create a divine structure was not confined to pyramids, temples, or monuments in ancient times, but is used in contemporary buildings as well. The United Nations building incorporates the concept of expanding the dimensions of each section by the golden ratio in its design proportions. Comprising of greenhouses with geodesic domes, the Eden project is made of hexagonal and pentagonal cells taking its cue from nature and implementing the use of the Fibonacci sequence in its design. There's even more math to be found in the building structure which is derived from the study of leaf patterns in plants. The structure plays an ode to nature by emulating the patterns that appear everywhere around us in one form or another, all following the same principles. The ancient builders utilized the belief that all things in existence have geometric and mathematical proportions, and this is apparent not only in structures, but music, cosmology, our DNA, and even space-time, which all resonate with a particular set of harmonics and measurable frequency. My name is Robert Sepper, I'm an anthropologist, my published work is available on Amazon as well as through various other major book outlets. They make a great gift. If you'd like to support my work, you can do that through patreon.com. There should be a link in the description section for those who are interested. I appreciate it very much. Thank you so much. Please hit the like button and subscribe for future updates. As always, I look forward to reading your comments, so kindly leave me your thoughts below. Please have a wonderful weekend and I hope to see you again soon.